Okay, so exam is Friday. It is um, covering, this is our last exam. It covers sections 4.1 to 4.4. That was all about functions. Um, that is questions 1, 2, 1, 2, 8. Questions 1 to 8 cover chapter 4. And then from 8 on, that is section 6, 1, and 6, 3. And remember, I, I took a couple of questions from section 6.2 and I just threw them in with the 6.1 material. Um, so the word problems, like uh, you'll see in number 10 and 11, those are technically from section 6.2, but I, I put them in the section 6.1 homework. All right, so let's talk about what I'm going to give you for the test. I will give you a sheet of paper that will have front and back. It will have some stuff on it. On the front will be these graph transformations. There's 10 of them. Um, and then on the back of this sheet, you will have these graphs of basic functions. I will give this to you on the day of the test. You do not need to bring a copy. Um, I will bring it for you. You can also use your formula sheet just like always. You can write on it front and back. I'll try to remind you as we go through the practice test some ideas of stuff to write on that. Um, so let's look at number one. Uh, so number one. So I really like parts A and B. Not going to put part C on the test. So this part will not be on the test. Just a heads up. It says, consider the following function. f of x equals negative 2 times the square root of x plus 5 plus 1. The function on the test will look really similar to this. Maybe it won't be a square root. Maybe it will be a cube root or something similar. Maybe it will be absolute values. Um, but it will be really similar to this. So one thing that is not on, I guess it's, it's really its own this graphs of basic functions, but I think it's kind of useful to have them written out um, as a list, and this might be something you want to add to your formula sheet. Just a list of all of our basic functions. So we have like y equals a number, y equals x, y equals absolute value of x, y equals x squared, y equals x cubed, square root of x, cube root of x and then 1 over x and 1 over x squared. So this is like just a list of all of your basic functions which I think is helpful for part A of this problem. So this might be something you want to add to your formula sheet just like a list of all those basic functions. Right, so for part A, it says, determine the more basic function that has been shifted, reflected, stretched, or compressed. So you're looking at this function f of x and you're saying, okay, which one of these does it most closely resemble? So which one do y'all think? Yes, yeah, square root of x. Good. So this one most closely resembles square root of x. So that would be our basic function that has been shifted reflected, stretched, or compressed. You can write y here, you can write f of x, it doesn't matter either way. f of x and y are the same thing. All right, so part b, determine how the function has been shifted, reflected, stretched, or compressed. This means just list out the transformations. All right, so just list them out. All right, so I'm going to grab our transformation sheet. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. All right, so we're going to get our transformation sheet. This is from section 4.1. And we're just going to go straight to, we're going to start on the left and move towards the right. So we're starting with this negative out front. So you're going to look on your transformation sheet and see, okay, which one has a negative out front? That's right here. Right, so a negative out front means reflect across x-axis. So that's all you need to write. You just copy it straight down. 
reflect across x-axis. Okay, so now we've taken care of the negative, we're moving on to the two. Right, so we've got a whole number out front. And what I did earlier is I rewrote the function up here with my first class. That's what I mean by earlier. Um, but what I did was I kind of just marked through each piece as I listed the graph transformation. So we cross off the little negative. We've already written that transformation down. We're multiplying on the outside by a whole number. Right, so we've got a whole number on the outside that's here. Right, so a whole number on the outside means stretch vertically by a factor of whatever the number is. So stretch vertically by a factor of 2 in this case. All right, so stretch vertically by a factor of 2. But that was the second one. We can cross that one off. We've taken care of that. Now we're inside. We're inside the radical. All right, so on the inside, we're adding 5. Uh, so you go to your list of transformations. Okay, you look for the ones that's on the inside of the parentheses. Inside of the parentheses is here, here, and some down here at the bottom. But we're adding a number inside the parentheses right here. Uh, so if you're adding a number inside, then you're shifting left, whatever the number is. So shifting left five units. Everybody okay so far? Okay. So we can cross that part out. We've taken care of the plus 5. And then now we're back on the outside. We're at the plus 1. All right, so plus 1 on the outside. Plus the number on the outside is at the very top. Shift up 1 unit. So shift up and then it's whatever the number is. Shift up that many units. So shift up 1. Okay, so just a couple of things to note. What you have to tell me, you got to include the number here. So you can't just tell me shift left. You got to tell me shift left five. You can't just say shift up. You got to say shift up one. Um, and then with the stretch vertically by factor of, you got to tell me it's a factor of two. You can't just say stretch vertically. Um, so make sure you write out. You're basically just copying this this part over here down, and you're filling in whatever the number is. Um, now, part C says sketch the graph of the function. We're not going to do this on the test, but if you're doing this on the practice test, just put it in your calculator and just sketch what the graph looks like. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, part, or excuse me, number two. Um, this one is off of the homework. You can look at your graphs of basic functions and say, okay, which graph does this look most similar to? You can see it looks like a cube root function. So you know it's going to be something to have to do with a cube root. Um, and then you say, okay, well, originally this was going through the origin, but here it looks like it's gone down. Let's see, one, two, three, four, and then to the left, two. So down four, left two, and it's the cube root of x. All right, so to go down four, now you're going to your transformation sheet. To go down 4, that's here, so we got to subtract that number on the outside. Right, so subtract it on the outside. And then to go left 2, left 2 is right here, you got to add it on the inside. So add the 2 on the inside of the radical. Right, so plus 2 on the inside. And that's your function. You can write f of x equals whatever. I don't anticipate putting this one on the test, but um, it is on the homework, and I, I really, I do like this question. It's just we can only have, you know, 10 questions on the test, so I have to be choosy. All right, now, number three, definitely going to see this one on the test, not this exact graph. Um, I don't love this picture uh, because it's got these numbers labeled. If you did the homework already, then you know this is from, like, the average rate of change problem. Um, so it doesn't, the, the number, the points that they have marked here don't mean anything. 
All right, so don't think the points indicate anything. So just kind of ignore these points. Um, let's look at, it says, consider the graph of the function below. Determine the intervals on which the function is increasing and then determine the intervals on which the function is decreasing. All right, so three things to remember. This might be something you want to add to your formula sheet. All right, so three things to remember when you're doing these increasing, decreasing constant problems. And there's formula sheets up here. I, I brought a bunch this time, so you can feel free to take a couple of them in case you mess up. Uh, so increasing, decreasing, constant, three things to remember. Always use X values. If it helps you, you can go straight in and just mark out all the Y values. So always use X values, always use parentheses. And then the very last one, most people always remember this one. It's the first two that people usually forget. Um, you read graphs left to right. Just like you read sentences. All right, so you always read graphs left to right. So always use X values. Don't look at the Y values. Mark them out if they if it's tempting to look at those. Always use parentheses. Never brackets. Right? There should be no brackets in your answers on these problems. And this, again, specifically applies to the increasing, decreasing constant problems. All right, so, again, ignore the points that are labeled. I just grabbed this graph off of a different problem. So, um, just ignore the points. Let's look at what's happening here. We're reading this left to right. This is increasing until it gets to about right here. Right, so that's where it starts decreasing. Then it's decreasing all the way up into here. And then it's increasing again. Right, so you can write straight on the graph. You could write increasing, if this helps you. And then decreasing and then increasing again. This one didn't have any constant intervals, but you will have a constant interval on the test for sure. All right, so two increasing, one decreasing. And like I said, if these Y values are, are tempting for you to use, just mark them out. Don't look at these Y values. Right, we're just looking at the X values, so let's see here. We'll come back to this part here in a second, but let's see where we marked this line, um, how they have the units marked here. So we have two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four. All right, so this is two and a half. Each one of the tick marks represents one half. So two and a half, then three, three and a half, four. All right, so it's increasing all the way up to two and a half, then from two and a half to six, six and a half, seven. It's decreasing, and then we're increasing again. All right, so over here, this is our number line, our X's. On the number line on this way, you're going to negative infinity. This way, you're going to positive infinity. Right, so from negative infinity all the way up until this point right here, we're increasing. Right, so from negative infinity to 2.5, we're increasing. Negative infinity to 2. Point, not negative 2.5, sorry, positive 2.5. Right, always use parentheses, so close those up with parentheses. You don't have to use a union symbol here. You can just write the word and. And then we're increasing again right here. So from the x value of 7 all the way to positive infinity, we're increasing. So from 7 to positive infinity. And then where is it decreasing? That was in the middle right here. So that was from 2.5 to 7. So from 2.5 to 7. Close those up with parentheses. Okay. Now I know this looks easy, especially when I'm helping you. But this is a really commonly missed question on the test, so study this one and practice it. 
um, even though you might you might see this as you're studying, you think, oh, I, I definitely have that one. That one's super easy. Um, go through the homework and practice these. Maybe go back to that. I think this is section 4.2. Um, we do your practice parts just so you can get some extra practice with these. Um, I can tell you the graph on the test will look something like this. Um, just to give you a heads up. It's kind of a unique looking graph. Um, it looks something like this. Something like that. This isn't like a perfect drawing. But you can see it's got like a constant part, then we're decreasing, increasing, and then still increasing. So you're going to have a constant part, a decreasing, and an increasing for the test. All right, so we'll put a little star beside this one. Commonly missed. Usually what I'll see, just the, the common mistakes, is I'll see people will put brackets around here, um, or they will include some y values in their, um, in their intervals. So remember these three things. Use x values, use parentheses, and read graphs left or right. Also, my, my mistake just now was I didn't read the, the x-axis, and so instead of 2.5, I put 3 yeah. instead of 7, so make sure you... Yeah, yeah, and this graph sucks. Like, I didn't realize when I picked this one that the, um, that the units were so weird. Like, if I had thought about that beforehand, I would have picked a different graph. But the one I picked for the test will be, you know, easier to read. This one is not great. Um... Let's look at number four. I don't think I'm going to put this on the test, but it is a good question. And maybe if I have not you know, room for an extra question on the test, this might be something that I throw on there. Consider the graph of the function below. Circle either maximum or minimum and fill in the blank. And it wants to know, is it a local maximum or a local minimum? All right, so this is a parabola. Um, there's no maximum here. It's just going to keep increasing forever. But it does have a minimum down here is this point. What is this point? The origin. the origin. Yeah, so this is the point zero, zero. That's a good start is to identify that point, you know, and write it down. Because we're going to need to use the x and the y value here. All right, so circle either maximum or minimum and then fill in the blank. All right, so there is no maximum, but we do have a minimum. All right, so circle minimum for both of these. And then fill in the blank. The local minimum is located at the x value, and then our x value here is 0. So this is your x value. goes in the first blank. The value of the local minimum is, and then that's the y value. So also 0. So they just happen to be the same in this case. doesn't usually happen that way. But the x value goes in the first blank, the y value goes in the second blank. Okay. I'm going to skip number five because I know I'm not going to put that one on the test. We'll look at number six. I like number six and seven for the test, so both of these. All right, so it says consider the following functions f of x equals square root of x minus 1, and g of x is x plus 3 over 3. Same functions for both of these. Find a formula for f composed with g of x. All right, so let me zoom in on that. All right, so find a formula for, and you read this as f composed with g of x. And then it says you do not need to simplify your answer. All right, so let me show you the formula for f composed with g of x. We'll write it up here. Definitely something you want to add to your formula sheet. All right, so f composed with g of x is equal to f of g of x. And you always start on the inside. All right, so you might want to add that too. Start on the inside.
Okay. The ones with the variables are harder, ones with the numbers are easier. I think. Um, so, let's find f composed with g of x here. f composed with g of x, go ahead and just write down the formula, that's always your first step. Let's start on the inside, and inside here is g of x. So you're going to go up here and say, okay, well, they gave me g of x. They said g of x is x plus 3 over 3. So I'm going to take everything that's in this green circle and replace it with x plus 3 over 3. All right, so that becomes f of x plus 3 over 3. All right, so now I'm done with g. I don't care about g anymore. You can forget about it. Just cover it up. Um, now I'm only working with F, right? So I have F right here. I'm only working with F. And so we're going to take F, and everywhere there's an X, we're going to plug in this fraction. Right? So we're going to take this X right here and replace it with this fraction. All right, so that becomes big square root. X becomes our fraction, so X plus 3 over 3. And then minus 1. And you don't have to simplify. You can leave it just like that. Okay. Any questions? We okay? Um, as far as the functions, I'm probably keep them similar to this. Um, I might even, you know, do something different than a fraction here. Like maybe just make this like... I don't know, 2x squared plus 5x. Um, so something a little bit more simple instead of a fraction. All right, so it'll look really similar to this. Probably definitely, I, I will say that definitely one of them will be a radical. I don't know what the other one will be. I haven't written the test yet, obviously. Um, number seven. Consider the following functions, same ones from before. This time find f composed with g of 6. All right, so f composed with g of 6. All right, so write down your formula. This time, instead of x, we're going to have 6. All right, so f of g of 6. Same as before, start on the inside. So start with g of 6. And just ignore f. Right, so just ignore f and just look at g of 6. And I always like to go off to the side and do this um, just so I don't make my work too messy. Um, so I'll go over here to the side and I'll find g of 6. All right, so don't overcomplicate this. You're just taking 6 and you're plugging it into g. Right, so everywhere there's an x, you're going to replace that x with 6. Right, so that's going to become 6 plus 3 over 3. 6 plus 3 over 3. What does that simplify to? 3. All right, so everything, sorry my hair was in there. Um, everything that's in the green circle right here, g of 6, is going to become 3. That's what we found it was when we simplified all right, so everything in the green circle becomes 3. All right, so that is f of 3. And I'm going through this really slow, but you can probably do this super fast the more you practice it. All right, so f of 3. Now we're done with g. Forget about g. Now we're just looking at f. All right, so we're going to go up here to f. Everywhere there's an x, we're plugging in 3. So that's going to be big square root of 3 minus 1. which is square root of 2. And that's it. Okay. Any questions about composition of functions? Are you going to do g of f? No. Yeah, so the homework does some like other ones with g of f and maybe even like g of g and f of f. 
um, but just know that like if you have something like this G composed with F then it's the same exact formula you just switch the order so G goes on the outside F goes on the inside but yeah I usually just do F composed with G number eight is inverses I want to do part B but over here to the side I'm going to write the steps for finding an inverse uh, so there's four steps. This is what you'll want to write on your formula sheet. And I think I said this, but make sure you have this on your formula sheet as well. The, the definition or the formula for composition of functions. All right, so four steps for finding inverses. Now, I talked about this in class, but um, I gave you all a lot of background about inverses, like I told you about one-to-one -one and the horizontal line test. You don't have to know any of that for the test. You just need to know how to find the inverse. Uh, so four steps for finding inverses. Step one is just to replace f of x, whatever your function notation is, with y. Right, step two is to interchange or switch x and y. Step three is to solve for y. This is the, the longest step. And then step four is to replace y with your inverse function notation. So it's f with the little negative one of x. So f inverse of x. Make sure you have this on your formula sheet. And we'll do the same thing for the final. Um, I'll let you use a formula sheet and I'll, you know, since I'm giving you the graph transformations and the, the graphs of basic functions, I'll let you use that on the final too. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to skip A and do B instead because I know that I'm going to put one like this on the test. Um, and I'll just change the numbers instead of 4, 3, and 2, it'll be different numbers. All right, so hopefully everyone's got that. Four steps for finding inverses. All right, let's look at part B. Find a formula for the inverse of the following function. f of x equals negative 4 over 3x plus 2. All right, so step one, replace f of x with y. So take this f of x, replace it with y. Okay. Step two, interchange x and y. You can do this, like you can do both of those in one step if you want to. Um, all right, so I'm going to switch x and y. So this becomes x, y goes in the denominator. Step three, solve for y. All right, so with fractions, you always take the same approach. You're going to multiply both sides by the denominator. All right, so multiply both sides by the denominator to get rid of your fraction. Okay. When you multiply over here, it's going to cancel out. And then we're going to multiply through over on the left hand side. 3y times x. I like to put the variables in alphabetical order, so I'm going to write that as 3xy. So 3xy plus. 2 times x is 2x equals numerator over here was negative 4. But right, just remember I'm solving for y here, so I'm going to move that 2x over, subtract 2x, 3xy equals negative 4 minus 2x. What should I divide by to get y by itself? Good, 3x. You can do them both at one time. All right, so multiply, or excuse me, dividing by 3x. Now I have y equals negative 4 minus 2x over 3x. Don't try to cancel anything. The x's don't cancel. Um, x up here in the top is part of an expression, uh, so you can't just cancel it with something in the bottom. 
right, and then our very last step is to replace y with the inverse function notation, so f inverse of x. And you can factor a negative out of the top. It doesn't matter to me. You can leave it just like this. This is fine with me. Okay. Any questions about the inverse? This is one I have to put on the final too, so you want to make sure that you're um, good with this one because you're going to see it on this next test and you'll see it again on the final. Okay. Let's look at number nine. This is the start of the chapter six material. Um, I'm going to do part B because I'm running a little bit short on time. I only have like 20 minutes left. So um, there are three steps for solving elementary exponential equations. Right, let me pull them up on the notes and show you. All these notes are on D2L. But I just wanted to pull these up so you can take a picture. Does it fall? Yes. Up there. there. Steps for solving exponential equations. So if you want to take a picture of this, this is something that you might want to add to your formula sheet. Um, you can write this, you know, in in better terms. I think, like it says, I'll say the exponential expression. That's fine. Step two, I think, can be shortened. I would just say make both sides have the same base. And then step three, I would just say set the exponents equal and solve. Right, but they say isolate the exponential expression, find a base that can be used to rewrite both sides of the equation, and then equate the exponents and solve the resulting equation. Um, I picked sort of like the, for the practice test, I picked the easiest one of these and then the hardest one of these. Um, but the one I put on the test would be sort of like in between difficulty of these two. I think I mentioned in class that I wanted to put this one on the test. So if you want to take a picture, this is what the one on the test will look like. And then I'll just change the numbers from 8 and 14 to something else. So I forgot to put this on the practice test, but this is the one that I think I'm going to put on the test. Um, and we did this in class together. So if you go and look at the 6.1 notes, you'll see how I work this out. Okay. Let's do part B together because if you can do part B, um, the one on the test is not going to be as difficult as part B. So if you can do part B, then you'll be fine. All right, so we have 2 to the x squared plus 7x equals 8 to the negative 4. All right, so both of the, or excuse me, the exponential expression has been isolated. It's over here by itself. Um, and now I want to make both sides have the same base. So I look at my smaller base. Okay, smaller base is 2. How can I write 8? How can I write 8 as 2 to some power? 2 to the what? Not 4. Third. Yep, 2 to the third. 2 to the fourth would be 16. To the, and you can check that in your calculator. Don't feel like you have to come up with that off the top of your head. Um, so you could just keep plugging this in until you find the right number. Then you're going to use one of your properties of exponents. We have a power to a power, so we multiply them. So that's negative 12. Now the bases are the same. So you set the exponents equal. Right, so set the exponents equal. Okay, so x plus x squared plus 7x equals negative 12. This is a quadratic equation. You can either use the quadratic formula or you can factor this. Either way, everything needs to be on one side. So move that 12 over. I think we can factor this one. Um, what are some numbers that multiply to 12 but add to 7? Four and three. 
So x plus 4, x plus 3. Then just split those up and set them both equal to 0. And that's your answers. x plus 4 is 0, x plus 3 is 0. So x must be negative 4. And here x must be negative 3. All right, so that one's definitely harder than the one that will be on the test. So if you can do this one, you should be fine for the test. Okay. Number 10. Number 10 is super easy. Um, probably not going to put it on the test. You just plug in 9 for T. So it tells you this uh, model for the population of a city. And it says, what's the population in nine years? So you would just plug in nine for T. And don't forget, E is not a variable. It's that irrational number E. But number 11, I am going to put that one on the test. Oops, sorry. So let me write the formula off to the side over here. All right, so this is um, formula for a investment or a, what do they call it, like compound interest. So I'm going to scoot over here and write down the formula. A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the NT, where A is the future value of the account, P is the principal, that's the amount that you originally invest, R is the interest rate in decimal form, very important to remember that, that's the most common mistake here. N is the number of compounding periods. That it'll tell you that in the problem. Number of compounding periods. And then T is years, the number of years. And it's always in years. All right, so let's talk really briefly about compounding periods. Um, I think I told y'all there was three common ones. There's uh, monthly, quarterly, and semi-annually. Um, so, monthly, the compound period is the end value will be 12 for monthly, 12 months in a year. Um, quarterly, that's four times a year, so n would be four. And then semi-annually is twice a year, so n would be two. Uh, but let's look at this one. It says, Ava invests $7,500 in a new savings account which earns 3.2% annual interest, compounded semi-annually. Um, what would be the value of her investment after eight years round to the nearest cent? That's two decimal places. All right, so $7,500, that's her principal. So that's P. What's 3.2% as a decimal? In decimal form. Mm-hmm, 0.032. So you just take your number and you can divide it by 100. So 3.2 over 100. Oops, sorry, you couldn't see that. 0.032. All right, semi-annually, her interest is compounded semi-annually. That means twice a year, so N is 2. And then what is the value of her investment after 8 years? So... T is 8. Alright, so now we're just plugging all this in. Alright, so A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the NT. Alright, so we'll write in my numbers. That's 7,500 times 1 plus 0.032 over 2 raised to the NT. So super important to go ahead and multiply these if you have a TI-83. So go ahead and multiply 2 times, uh, or excuse me, N times T. So that's 2 times 8 is 16. But it's usually something easy, so I'd suggest everybody go ahead and multiply those. But you definitely important to do it if you have a TI-83. All right, let's type this in. 7,500 parentheses. 1 plus 0.032 over 2 raised to the 16th power. 
and two decimal places, Ava has 96.68 and 53 cents. And don't forget the dollar sign. I'll try to remember to tell you that on the day of the test. Uh, so don't forget the dollar sign, or maybe I'll put something in the problem like include units in your answer. Don't forget the dollar sign and don't forget cent, rounding to the nearest cent means two decimal places. Uh, so kind of a lot to remember on that one. Um, but there will only be one of these. So make sure you have this stuff in red over here, down on your formula sheet. Then I'll be right an example. Uh, then we have number 12. I'm not going to do this one with you. I just wanted to write down the formula. Um, it says convert the equation to either exponential form or logarithmic form. So here you're just using the definition of a logarithm, which looks like this. I'm going to write it down, then I'll read it to you. So x equals a to the y is the same as or is equivalent to y equals log base a of x. And this one on the left is called exponential form, but the one on the right is called logarithmic form. Okay. Number 13, just plugging these in the calculator. So plug into calculator. Again, whether or not I put um, 12 and 13 on the test is just going to depend on how much room I have or how many questions I still need. Um, and I wanted to mention Carly had showed me some of the questions on the homework will say don't use a calculator, just ignore the directions on the homework. Use a calculator. So if it tells you not to use the calculator, just ignore that part. Um, and then number 14 is our last one, which is perfect because we have six minutes left. Um, and I will show you part A. This is, I like both of these really for the test, um, but I know for sure I'm going to put part A on there. It says solve the elementary logarithmic equations. Again, the elementary just means these are the easier uh, versions of the equations. The harder versions are in section 6.5, which we didn't get to. Um, so we have 5 to the log base 2 of x equals 25. Now, your homework's going to tell you a different way to solve this. My suggestion is just to think of this as being like an exponential equation. Um, and use the techniques that we learned in section 6.1, which was to write both sides with the same base. So write 25 is 5 squared. And that makes this problem a lot easier. So then you have the same base. You can set the exponents equal. And then we've got a problem that looks really similar to part B. Uh, and now you're just using the definition of a logarithm. So that's going to be y equals log base a of x is the same as x equals a to the y. Then you go down here and you identify what is y, what is a, what is x. What is y in our example? 2. What is a? Also 2. And x is just x. Um, so we would go over here, plug it in, x equals a to the y. I like writing them in this particular order because you can kind of go straight up. So x equals a to the y, so x equals 2 squared, which is 4. Now there's one more that I forgot to put on the practice test. I'm going to show you really quick and then we will be done. So let me pull up the 6.2, or 6.3, sorry. 6.3 notes. It was this one right here. Natural log of e to the x equals 23.5. And remember I told you guys that if you just remember that natural log and e are inverses, they cancel each other out. Answer is x equals 23.5. 
So I like this one too for the test. Um, so if you want to take a picture of that one, that's in the notes from section 3.6.3, sorry. All right, let me stop the recording and I'll let you go.